folks. Let's uh, call this thing to order. Um, yeah, I'm NJ4Z, John Jenner, and trustee for the club and communications director. And welcome everybody to the uh, July presentation meeting. Um, uh, it's hard to believe we're in July already, but uh, we are here. It's actually beginning almost August. So um, sorry I'm not there in person tonight. Had some uh, issues come up that kept me away from the clubhouse, but uh, we are pleased to have uh, one of our members and past presidents, AE8J, Andy Kunick here tonight. Andy has uh, um, a wealth of knowledge for amateur radio. I'm not sure how long he's been licensed, but I'm sure it's uh, for a long time. And uh, he is uh, well-versed in a lot of different subjects, uh, including uh, for ham radio. Uh, Andy also uh, has a claim to fame. He builds the best darn keys anywhere in the pl on the planet. If you're a uh, CW guy, uh, we need to convince him to get back into making the magnet keyers. Um, if you own one, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't own one, I'm sorry for you, but you'll never get mine from me. Um, anyways, uh, I will uh, let Andy take it away. He's going to give us a presentation night on antenna analyzers. So, Andy, thank you very much, and uh, take it away, buddy. Okay, thank you, John. Appreciate it. And uh, for you guys who don't know me, um, that's me kind of right here, um, Andy, A-E-A-J. And um, tonight's presentation is on antenna analyzers and um, um how many guys in here own an antenna analyzer can you get a show of hands it's about half the people here in the club looks like are present here um well, that's great uh, they're they're a valuable instrument to have and there's been some significant advancements the last few years in uh, antenna analyzers uh, features that could only be found in um, vector network analyzers a few years back are now included in some of the uh, the latest uh, uh, antenna analyzers. Uh, things like graphical displays, frequency scanning, time domain reflectometers, and the frequency um, uh, that they cover keeps going higher and higher all the time. And the good news is there's many mo many models to choose from, and surprisingly the prices aren't going up that that much. Um, for uh, more capability, you can get an analyzer for about the same price that you bought one for uh, five or so years ago, and and um, they're a lot more capable to, today than they used to be. Um, well, what can you do with the antenna analyzer? Well, well, even the basic ones will tune an antenna to residence and um, uh, present the SWR, which is standing wave ratio. And some of the more advanced models will um, uh, also uh, measure return loss, which is similar to SWR. And we'll explain the differences there, what return loss is. Another thing uh, most antenna analyzers do is to measure complex impedance. And they measure the, um, the component parts of complex impedance, which is resistance and reactance. Although some of the more basic um, antenna analyzers uh, won't uh, distinguish the difference between capacitive reactance and inductive reactance. They'll just have one number for reactance. Uh, MFJ's uh, basic unit don't uh, don't differ it, differentiate, and uh, they re refer to it as reactance sign ambiguity because they won't, uh, which is a nice way of saying it. Um, it doesn't tell you whether it's capacitive reactance or inductive reactance. Another feature that many of the the um, analyzers will do is to um, test measure and test coaxial cable. Measure things like um, characteristic impedance, velocity factor, cable loss, cable length, things like that. And some of the lesser known measurements that analyzers will do is measure small values of capacitors and inductors. And measure and test um, balance and impedance transform. And enable you to tell the difference between a, a current balance and a voltage, a voltage balance, which is important. 
a lot of times when you buy a ballon, it uh, it won't uh, uh, have on the label what kind of ballon that it is, whether it's a current or a Bode ballon, but it's very important that you get the proper one. Uh, antenna, analyzer, antenna analyzers also um, measure traps and antenna cords. And with some analyzers, you can also design coaxial mat matching stubs, both quarter wave and half wave stubs. And then some of the very advanced features that you find on um, the newer analyzers is the time domain reflectometer feature, which detects cable ano anomalies and also tells you the distance to that fault. Um, it could be either a an open or a short or even a, a high or a low resistance. And um, your analyzers will, will tell you within a few inches of, of where that anomaly is located in your cable. Uh, another feature that um, is on, on the uh, analyzer that we'll, we'll be talking about tonight, which is the uh, Rig Expert A55 Zoom. Um, it has the capability of doing reference plane calibration. And what that allows you to do is to null out uh, the uh, influences of your coaxial cable. So once you do the reference, normally the reference plane calibration is right at the um, connector, on, uh, the antenna connector on the instrument. Um, but what uh, you can calibrate um, the analyzers to at the other end of the cable. If you've got a hundred foot long coaxial cable, and it it will by doing that, you're then looking at what the actual antenna is without the influences of the cable. Uh, and it's called a uh, open OSL or open short load calibration. And we'll explain that a little later. Another feature that this, this analyzer has that I really like on it is called SW, SW Air. And you can have the analyzer connected to your antenna cable back at the shack and the radio and program it on to send out a two meter signal to your handheld that you have in your pocket while you're in the backyard adjusting your antenna. And your antenna will tell you which way to tune your antenna by a series of beeps that you'll hear on, on your uh, handheld. Uh, and it'll start beeping faster or slower, uh, depending on whether you're getting closer to a one-to-one -one match or not. So uh, you don't have to keep running back and forth. Super feature. And here's the one we'll be talking about tonight. Um, what I'm talking, what I'm gonna be discussing tonight um, um, even though it will be based on this analyzer, um, what I have to say will, will uh, apply to many analyzers, uh, not, not only this one. But, but the features on this one, it covers um, uh, 60 kilohertz to 55 megahertz. It has uh, impedance ranges from 25 to 600 ohms in eight steps, I think it is. It has a... Um, uh, SO239 connector or UHF connector at the top here. It's a nice, pretty good size screen. Waterproof keypad, the USB connector on the bottom. And a nice feature, it only offer, it takes only two AA batteries. <laughs> For the guys that own the old MFJs where you had, I don't know, 10 batteries in the thing. And every time you went to use it, the batteries were dead, it seemed like. Um, and um, it's sometimes referred to as a single port VNA because it, it actually can do many of the same things that, that a um, vector network analyzer can do. And there's a two year warning. They do, they do offer a Bluetooth version, but the, feet, the one I have doesn't have the uh, Bluetooth feature. I think that only let, lets you, you don't need a cable to connect it to your computer basically is all that does. And the reason I chose the 55 zoom is most modern amateur radios um, cover a frequency range of 160 through six meters. 
so that kind of fit my requirements uh, um, for the the uh, HF bands and uh, six meter. But the uh, rig expert offers uh, a full line of uh, analyzers, and I'm not a salesman for rig expert. I'm I'm just a satisfied use, user. I've had this uh, analyzer for about two years now, and um, I'm still amazed about all the features that it has. But they offer two versions of the um, HF analyzers. Uh, the VHF analyzer analyzer goes up to 230 megahertz, I think. And then there's actually three, but there's one more that they've added, uh, I guess maybe now a year ago, that goes all the way up to two gigahertz. Um, and I think there's also a couple, they call it the stick and the pro stick, where, where it's tiny little pocket type analyzers, I think that they're offering now too, that I, I haven't shown here. Here is the um, um, menus on, on the uh, A55 Zoom, has a main menu and two sub menus. Um, the main menus, you can pick the function you want from um, by scrolling through the menu or selecting it with a hotkey here on the side. The setup menu allows you to change the uh, English, the color. Uh, it has a battery saver option. It, you can adjust the sound. It has a beeper sound you can adjust. It's, it'll switch between um, intermetric units, or imperial or, or metric. And you set it up for what part of the world you live in. The, the bands, the amateur bands are slightly different in different parts of the world. So you have to set it up for for us here in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and then you, you set a default cable velocity factor. And then this the tools menu here mainly do with um, um, coaxial cable measurements. And it does have a self menu for self-test function on the menu. And um, it has an extensive context sensitive uh, help menu for every function. And an analyzer is a tool that you don't really use every day. And one is as feature rich as this thing is and complicated. Um, th this wasn't included in the documentation. So I, uh, I printed out my own here. And so now I have a reference for every time I take it out and use it, I, I can go right to the, the, the help menu that I need. Uh, and here's some of the, um, these are displays that have to do with antenna measurement functions. Um, Rig Expert calls them charts. So you'll see a the Smith chart mode, the SWR graph frequency, uh, SWR versus frequency graph, they call the SWR chart. And then it has a conventional uh, analog looking meter here for the old school guys. It also has a uh, re resistance reactance chart, a return loss chart, and a cool feature that I really like here is the multi SWR feature. It will display in real time up to five different frequencies, the SWR on five different frequencies. So this is great for uh, adjusting a multi band vertical antenna, say. Um, you set it up to the frequencies that you want. And as you're making the adjustments, it's not only showing you the changes you're making on the, the band that you're adjusting, but it's also showing you how it's affecting some of the other bands, if any. So it's a great feature for setting up multi-band antennas. And here are the uh, displays for cable testing. It shows a cable loss versus frequency, characteristic impedance versus frequency, and then the cable uh, velocity factor and length. 
And these are coaxial matching stuffs, which I've never used. So I don't know much about those. Uh, the antenna that most of uh, these measurements were taken on is uh, my, actually two antennas. This is one of two antennas. This is a hex beam that covers six bands, 20 through, through six meters. And the performance is similar to a three element YAG. And if you're not familiar with the hex beam, it kind of resembles an upside down uh, umbrella with the uh, fabric removed. And it has two wires for each band. It has a driven element and a reflector that goes around the back of the driven element for each band. And then my other antenna is a uh, 80 meter horizontal loop. And I do have one third antenna, which is a um, 160 meter end fed halfway. Um, here's all the frequencies, ham bands actually, that the uh, AA55 Zoom covers. Each little blue bar here is a ham band. So, and this is the full range from 60 kilohertz up through 55 megahertz. So you can see it starts out with the 2.2 uh, kilometer band. I don't know. How in the world are you building that? 2.2 kilometers is almost a mile and a half. So a dipole antenna for 2.2 kilometers would be three quarters of a mile long, a halfway dipole. <laughs> kind of wow. Um, but here, here's the bands that's covered on the uh, my hex beam, 20 through six meters. And if I do a full scan, it shows you where the dips are, the SWR, on each of the six bands that the uh, hex beam covers. And you can see we're, we're, we're below 1.5 on just about every, uh, every band that it covers. Uh, they call it the zoom because it, it has the capability of zooming Zooming in and out, you use the um, up and down and right and left arrow keys. So the up and down zooms you in and out, and the uh, left and right pans you uh, left and right through the frequency range. Um, there's actually three different ways to um, get to the frequency of interest. You can pan and zoom to where you want to go, or it has a direct frequency input from the uh, numeric pad here, similar to what you would do on, on a, on a um, BNA. You'd enter the center frequency, and then you would enter the plus and minus scan on each side of the frequency that you, the center frequency that you want the in instrument to scan to. And then the third way, which is probably the, the most convenient way, I think, is you pull up the band select menu, you press function F and zero, and you get this menu, and you go directly to the band that you want. Here, here if you press um, the one here, you get the 80 meter band. And what, what it shows here, it puts you right in the center of the 80 meter band. That's what this cursor here is. And then if you press the scan button, you get a nice scan. It takes about a second to get a scan. And the, the information that it shows is the minimum SWR is 1.11 at 3.54 megahertz. I'm a CW guy, so that's right where I want to be. And, but it also shows you um, the SWR to center of the band here with 2.21. And if you want to know what it is at different places along the band, you just scan right and left and it'll display the SWR at any uh, frequency within the 80 meter band there. Well, what is SWR? Um, SWR is for standing voltage wave ratio. VSWR, sometimes you hear, or VISWAR, you hear, it's all the same thing. 
What it is is a ratio of forward voltage to the reflected voltage measured at any given point along a transmission line. As RF power counters an impedance mismatch, the current current voltage becomes separated. And part of that voltage is reflected uh, back towards the transmitter. And the amount of voltage reflected back is proportional to the important impedance mismatch. Most accurate results of SWR measurements should be taken right at the antenna. And that's where I explained this um, calibration uh, function of the of this analyzer does. You can actually uh, set the calibration point at the antenna and take a measurement back in the shaft and eliminate any effects that the coax might be influencing. And SWR is the most easily measured, and I would say arguably the least important parameter of an antenna system. And I think it's the most misunderstood antenna system parameter. SWR tells us nothing about how an antenna, your antenna is performing. Here's a chart that shows the actual amount of power that's lost at varying SWR levels. And you can see when you get down to, uh, to 1.6 to 1, you still have 90% of your power going out and you're only losing 5%. But this is only due to the mass. It, it, it does not, this chart doesn't uh, uh, include any losses of the coax or any other losses in the system. It's only SW, uh, the loss due to SWR. When you get down here to two to one, most modern day transceivers start rolling the power back around two to one to protect the uh, finals in the transmitter. And, but still at two to one, you're still at 80% of your power. So that's not too bad. You get down here at uh, five to one, and you've lost about 50% of your power. Here's return loss. And uh, return loss is similar to SWR. And it's an indication of how well the antenna absorbs RF energy. And it's measured in dBm. Um, engineers, electrical engineers or RF engineers don't talk about SWR. When they talk about a, a loss, transmission loss, it's, they talk in terms of return loss because it's measured in dB and they don't have to convert back and forth from SWR to dB because most other most other uh, RF formulas uh, use uh, decibel to uh, in, in their calculations so you don't have to be converting back and forth all the time. Um, if, if you hear an engineer talk about SWR he's probably a hand because most engine, engineers won't when we talk about SWR, you only talk about return loss. But there is a correlation between um, SWR and return loss. In fact, you can, can there's formula here to convert back and forth, or there's plenty of handy charts out here on the internet, internet that will um, uh, do the conversions for you. And here's a, an interesting slide here. Is resonance frequency and lowest SWR frequency the same? Well, many cases it is, but not always. It doesn't have to be. Here's a case here with, of my hex beam. And this is 15 meters. And um, the resonance point here 
is where this blue line, which is the reactants, crosses the zero line here. This means you have no inductive reactants and no capacitive reactants, so they cancel each other out. And that's where residence happens, right here at the, this frequency. But I, I, I do an SWR scan at that very same frequency, and it, look, it's telling me my lowest SWR is clear up here out of the band. That's a pretty good example. And, and you'll find it, you won't find this on a dipole or a single band antenna. It's probably in multi band antennas where you see this the most. But it does not have to be resonant frequency and, and lowest SWR frequency, it does not have to be the same. And here's the uh, S meter display, and it displays uh, an analog style S meter, and it tells you also a digital the SWR in digital form, and it also displays the return loss here. And here's that SWR to air feature. You program a frequency in the analyzer, and you tune your handheld to that frequency and put this in continual, continuous scan mode. And you go out and do your antenna adjustments and while listening to your uh, the beeps on your handheld. And it's uh, helping you dial in the exact lowest SWR point um, by listening to the beeps. Here's that multi SWR feature here. It'll do up to five bands. It also has a uh, five uh, graph here, but I find the graphs not quite as useful as, as the numbers up here when you're adjusting a multi band antenna. And it has memory mode here, so you can actually store, take a measurement and st store the screen in, in uh, has up to 10 memory. So um, this is useful for when you first put your antenna up and get it adjusted like you want. And I find it helps to take a benchmark or a, a signature of your antenna and save it in memory so you know exactly how your antenna is performing when you put it up and then a year or two down the road if you're having issues you can compare a, a your current scan with the original scan here and, and tell you if there's any differences And you can also download the software from the uh, Rig Expert website uh, that uh, connect your uh, analyzer to the computer. And, and instead of a small screen, you get the um, um, your results here on much your larger con computer screen. So it's a, a lot handier, especially if you're doing a lot of calculations and measurements. And here is the uh, resistance reactance chart. And resonance is where the blue line, which is reactance, crosses zero here. And the yellow line is resistance. So we can see here that um, at resonance here, our resistance is probably around, I don't know, 40, oh, close to 50 ohms, maybe a little less, 47, 48 ohms there. Anywhere above the zero line, that's inductive reactance. And by convention, that's plus J ohms. And we'll explain what the J is here a little later. Anywhere below zero, 
is capacitive reactance, and that's minus J ohms. Now here's an example. Uh, this is react. This showing me that my resonance frequency here is. And this is on the 80 meter band. 3.552 megahertz. And my lowest SWR is 3.54 megahertz. So here's an example where the SWR low point and the um, resonance point is the same. In most cases, that's what you find, but it doesn't always have to be. Another uh, useful display on the uh, analyzer is this uh, all data parameters mode. So here in one screenshot, it tells you uh, the resistance, the impedance, the total reactance, the inductive reactance, the capacitive reactance, the phase angle, return loss, capacitance, inductance, and the SWR here in one view. And I, I, I validated these readings several different ways. I went on to one of the calculators on the website and I plugged in the numbers and they came out exactly to what the analyzer was reading. And I also did it the old fashioned way. I calculated the uh, uh, capacitive reactance and the inductive reactance and, and the uh, impedance. I got the exact same number. So it's a uh, very accurate in measuring all those parameters. Here's cable loss function. Um, here's a scan that I did of some RG8 foam that's 40 plus years old, and I measured it to be 75 feet. And for, for 40 plus years old cable, it, it doesn't do bad. I'm having trouble seeing my screen here. I couldn't find RG8 here, but it um, looks like it's 1.6 per 100 foot. Loss 1.6 dB, and on my chart here, that's about what I'm getting. Of course, now this is 75 feet, and that's 100 feet. So for 100 for 40 old 40 year old coax, it's uh, not bad. And um, in order to do the calculations, you, you need to use the um, I made these myself, but you need to open, short, low calibrate. You can buy these, but they're, they're lab grade when you buy them and they're pretty expensive. But for HF frequencies, you can make your own because uh, the error that introduced isn't going to be that great at uh, HF frequencies. But one of them is just an open. And then another one is just a short. Another one, I put a 1% uh, a uh, 50 ohm resistor in it. So that, that's, I built my own OSL calibration. Building. And here's a cable length and velocity factor. You need to know one or the other. Uh, if you, you if you know the velocity factor, you enter that in, and uh, it'll tell you the uh, cable length. Or if you know the cable length, you put in the, the length, and it'll tell you what the velocity factor. Is. Characteristic impedance. Again, you need the um, calibration elements measure the characteristic impedance. And here's the scan of that same piece of coax, which it's it's bouncing right around. That's a little hot, it's around 60 ohms, it looks like. About 60 ohms. Yeah. Yes. Does the manufacturer provide a spec sheet with the velocity factor. Yes. Yep. So if we have that, 
Right. Okay. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Transmission and feed. Amateur radio transmission systems include many impedances and resistance. You got the output impedance of the transmitter, which is the source impedance. You got the impedance of the transmission line, which is the characteristic impedance. You got the transmission line ohmic losses, which um, copper wire resistance basically, mostly. And then you have the antenna impedance, which changes the frequency, which is the load impedance, and also the radiation resistance of the antenna. Maximum power is transferred when the load impedance at the antenna matches the source impedance at the transmitter. If only resistance were present, it, it would be present. It would be pretty simple um, because the Resistance of the source in ohms would equal the resistance of the loading, regardless of what frequency you have. But for us hams in the real world, our systems include reactants as well as these. Every time we change the frequency on, on our radios, turn that knob, we introduce reactants. And reactive loads cause the RF voltage and the current to get out of phase or separate. I remember that according to Ohm's law, power in watts is equal to volts times amps or volts times current. So if these things separate, then our power go goes down. One or the other reduces, the power reduces. So here's an easy way to remember um, whether it, it's a, a capacitive reactance or an inductive reactance. In an inductor here, L, this is Eli the ice man. In, a, in an inductor, L here, voltage, E, comes before current, I. And in a capacitor, C, the current I comes before the voltage E. So if you remember Eli, the, I know this is a lot, probably since the beginning of ham radio tests, that's been on uh, in some form, many of the ham radio tests. So if you just remember Eli, the ice man, it's a good way to remember uh, that, that uh, what comes first. Here's something I call the SWR chain react. If, if your antenna is tuned exactly to the center of the 40 meter band and your radio is set at a frequency right at the center of the 40 meter band, all is right with the world. Your antenna will be in residence, your SWR will be low. low. But as soon as you turn that knob, your your antenna is no longer at resonance. There's going to be either a capacitive or an inductive reactance introduced. Tuning down in frequency makes the antenna too short. And tuning up in frequency makes the antenna too long. And so this causes a change in impedance because the formula impedance includes both capacitive and inductive reactants. So you change either one of those in our impedance term. And this is what causes an impedance mismatch. And the current and voltage become separate. Some of the forward voltage is reflected back towards the transmitter. And this is what results in standing waves.
know, resistance and, and reactance values can be directly combined. They're uh, similar, but they're not the same. So you just can't add them together. So they're represented by what's called a complex number. And a complex number is, is comprised of two parts. It's got a real part, with, which is the resistance part. And it's got an imaginary part, which is the J reactance part. And I don't like the term imaginary. It kind of makes it sound like there's some kind of magic going on or it's mystical or something. <laughs> there's nothing magic about it. Um, it's, it's just, and I don't know why they call it imaginary, but it has something to do with the square root of minus one. There's, other sciences use imaginary numbers, but they use I instead of J. I think in electronics, they use J because I've already taken it. But inductive reactance by convention is designated as a plus J ohms, JX ohm reactance ohms. And capacitive reactance by convention is designated as a minus J. So we would express complex, complex impedance, like the source impedance would be the resistance of the source plus or minus the reactance of the source. And the load would be the same thing. When the source impedance equals the load impedance, this condition is called something that's called a uh, complex conjugate match. That's when all the available power is absorbed by the load and no power is reflected back towards the source. And if you would plot that on a graph, here's what it would look like. We have resistance along the horizontal line here and reactance on the vertical line here. And so if we have seven units of resistance and three units of reactance, our total our impedance is going to be equal to the length of this line, which is the hypotenuse of this right triangle. And for the mathematical scholars in the crowd, you will recognize this formula as a formula to find the impedance of the right triangle. It's called the Pythagorean theorem. So that's how you combine resistance and reactance. Another function of the A55 zoom is Zoom is the uh, Smith chart. It's a graphical vis visualization of complex impedance and how it changes with frequency. Now, I never paid much attention to Smith charts before I got this analyzer. I kind of thought it was a tool from bygone days. Kind of went to the way of the buggy whip. But um, once I got this analyzer, I've, I've got a newfound appreciation for uh, the Smith charts. Um, on the Smith chart, the horizontal line here represents resistance. And at the center of the chart on the horizontal line is a one. And because we have our, remember I told you at the very beginning, you could set this analyzer up for eight different impedances. Well, if you set it up for a 50 ohm impedance, which normally would, we would do with um, 50 ohm coax, uh, that one is 50 ohms, right in the dead center of the Smith chart. And down here is, um, to, to the right is infinity, and to the left, zero down here, 
the zero ohms are short. So we have an open at this end and short at that. And then the numbers in between, for instance, the 0.5 here at the left is 50 times 0.5, which is 25 or 25 ohms. And at the two of the right here, it would be 50 times two, which is 100 ohms. And the red square, well, it looks like it's the red circle or square, whatever it is, is um, complex impedance. J50 or 50 ohms, J0 ohms at 3.75 megahertz. So that's that's one that's one to one right there. Above the horizontal horizontal line, remember, just like on the other charts, is plus J, which is inductive reactance. Anything below the equator here is minus J which is capacitive reactants. So if we do a scan now of our 80 meter antenna, and we increase the frequency, this little red indicator here moves clockwise to make this arc, indicating that the antenna is getting longer because it's moving in a more positive direction. In the top half. Decreasing in frequency, it moves along this arc. Telling us our, our antenna is too short. And the further from the center that we get, the higher the SWR. Here it shows it at the this is right at the 30.536, and here it is, it's 37.34 up here, and down here is 33.5, or 3.35 megahertz. These, the red and green circles don't show up on the analyzer. I, I drew these on the with the computer just to indicate what happens here. Anywhere inside the green circle here represents an SWR of two to one. So at point one here, we've got our own, we've got 25 ohms. We're neither inductive or capacitive reactants. So we've got we've got some reactants. It's it's plus J at this end a little bit. And at the other end, the hundred ohms, and it's minus J. Wait a minute, I'm doing it again. Here it's twenty-five ohms and zero J because it's neither inductive or capacitive. That's a point one. At point two here, we're back at 50 ohms, but we got J35 here. You've got a, an inductive, so it's plus J35 at this point. We keep going around our circle, and here we're at two, so it's 100 ohms, and we're back to zero J now because we're right on the equator again here. We go all the way around to point four. Now we're back to 50 ohms here, and we're minus J35. So as you do your scan and you see anything within that range, and you know your SWR is less than two to one. And then the red circle is an SWR of three to one or less. So anywhere within the red circle is an SWR of three to one. And which you could go on out for me. So that's kind of how you read a Smith chart for complex impedance. Well, how important is SWR anyway? 
Well, Walt Maxwell, he was a technical for, technical advisor for the ARRL a few years back. He's a silent key now. I think he died in 2012. He was an RF engineer for RCA. And then later in his career, he worked for NASA, and he actually developed the uh, parabolic dish on the moon buggy. You remember seeing the pictures of the original moon buggy? It had a parabolic dish antenna on it. And Walt Maxwell was the guy who designed that system. His call was W2DU. But he's best known in the amateur world for his uh, series of articles that he wrote back in the 70s and explaining concepts such as line loss, SWR balance, and antenna tunings. And it's an interesting book, this Reflection 3s. Um, he really goes into a lot of detail and explains it in layman's terms um, about SWR and antenna matching and so on. But here, here's one of his excerpts out of his latest book, Reflections 3. He says, it can be shown mathematically and easily verified in practice that the difference in power transferred through any coaxial line with an SWR of two to one is imperceptible compared to having a perfectly matched one to one terminator. So that's right from the horse's mouth. You hear this argument a lot on the, you listen on the radio, even on two meters. How important is SWR? Well, you can take it to the bank when this guy said it because he's one of the experts in this field. But there's some places where SWR does matter. For solid state transmitters, most radios start uh, reducing power around two to one to protect the final transistor. Back in the old days, you didn't have to worry about that because you really had a, a tuner built into the transmitter with the, um, when you dip the plate, you turn, tune the load. That was really an antenna tuner built right into the radio. So you could match the antenna or match the, the end of the feed line to your radio uh, by tuning the transmitter. With, the with today's solid state radios, you don't have those tune controls now. so. They have to limit uh, the SWR to protect the final. Another place where SWR matters is very long coax. Even at high frequencies, a small amount of reflected power, power takes, will take several strips bouncing back and forth in your feed line before it gets radiated. And remember, each strip up and each strip back because of IR losses in the cable, you lose some of that signal. So, and that will heat your coax too if it's severe enough. And that's due to the only losses in the cable itself. In fact, if you have a thousand foot coax and hook any analyzer to it, it's always going to look. You're always going to have a one-to-one -one match, no matter what you got at the other end of that coax because you're going to lose all your signal coming back down the, down the wire. Because this thing only puts out several mill, three milliwatts or something less maybe. So all that signal is going to be eaten up coming back down the tail. So you're not going to be able to measure an antenna at a thousand foot or even probably even less than the code. Another place where SWR makes a difference is at the VHF and UHF frequencies. As coax losses are dramatically increased in frequency with the increase of frequency. But it's more of a concern on and receive really than it is transmit in this case. Feeding a half wave dipole. If you got a dipole that's half wave length long, um, and the, the feed point 
if it's if it's at least a half wavelength high, the feed point impedance is 73.1 plus J, J0 ohms. So that's what you expect out of the dipole down to the half wavelength high. That's at present, of course. Um, and if you feed that dipole with 50 ohm coax cable, the calculated SWR is going to be 73.1 divided by 50. So your SWR is going to be 1.46 to 1. If you have a dipole with a 50 ohm coax and the SWR measures 5 to 1 or less, don't mess with it. That's where it's supposed to be. If you try to adjust it any more, trying to make it one to one, you're only going to make your antenna work. The way you you change the impedance is by raising and lowering the antenna or moving moving somewhere else. But there's some kind of outside influences affecting maybe a building or the ground or trees, anything. Uh, is is but it, it's not not making the antenna shorter is not going to change the impedance. It may look like it does, but it's not. And these are some excerpts from um, Walt Maxwell's book that are interesting. I thought everyone's looking for an SWR one to one. Question is why. And you hear these on the radio all the time, if you listen for any length of time. I'm not getting out on this frequency because my SWR is 2.5 to 1. There's too much power coming back and not enough getting into the antenna. Another one you may hear is, if I feed a line having that much SWR, the reflected fire power flowing back to the amplifier will burn it up. And another one, I don't want my feed line to radiate. Well, what Walt says about these, any of these answers shows a misunderstanding of reflection mechanics and are symptomatic to the present state of thinking on this side. And here's my favorite SWR myth. And uh, some of you old C CB guys will know what I'm talking about here. You keep hearing the old saw over and over again. You can cut your coax and reduce the SWR to one to one. Or the CBers have cut the coax and watch their SWR reduced to one to one so they can't be talked out of this area. What's actually happening in this case is a measurement artifact that makes it appear to be true. And we'll talk about what that measurement artifact is here in a minute. Of course, we hams are more intelligent, more enlightened than sea beers, and we don't believe that here, right? The only proper way to reduce the SWR to one to one is to tune the antenna to resonance and then match the impedance. Well, what is that measurement artifact? Well, it's common mode current. Here we show a dipole. It's fed directly with 50 ohm coax. So what we end up with here is a balanced antenna, which is a, di a dipole is an unbalanced feed line. With what we mean by unbalanced feed line is one side of the, the shield of the coax is connected to the ground back here at the transmitter. So that makes it unbalanced. But what happens is that current has now a third path. It can come back down the outside of the coax shield. Here. So now, instead of a dipole, you now have a, a tripole because the, the shield of your coax now is radiating here. Because of this, this this is a a 
because of the connected to ground here, this is a low impedance path to the ground. So part of that signal is going to, to follow that low impedance path to the ground. So that explains when you cut the line shorter, if you have common mode current in your feed line, and you will have if you don't use a ballon, uh, it's going to change your uh, resonance frequency of that antenna. And you can adjust it, your SWR by shortening that. But that's not, you don't want to do it that way. You want to use a ballon and leave your feed line. Current, always a current. So what's the moral of our story here? If the antenna is matched to the transmission line with the feed line choke or current bound, then the input, input, input impedance does not depend on the length of the transmission. If your antenna has low SWR across the entire band, you better check your antenna and feed line. Antennas with high resistance conductors, velocity loading coils, and poor ground system will all present low SWR over a broad frequency range. Low SWR tells us nothing about how well our antenna is worth working. To know that, you have to be able to measure radiation efficiency, which AMS can't do. Dummy load has excellent SWR, but fails to radiate. Some antennas are like that too. All right, final question for us here. Does an antenna tuner tune your antenna? It says antenna tuner right on it there. <laughs> well, the answer is, despite his name, it does not actually tune the antenna. It matches the complex impedance of the transmitter to that of the input and the feedback. So if you're interested in more information about the A55 Zoom, back in QST in November, they did a um, review. We've got some more good information on this analyzer. So we encourage you to look that up. And here's some uh, preferences. By the way, uh, Walt Cook's online here if you want to look that up. Very good information here. And here's some, it's old, but very good uh, information on, uh, on how waves are transmitted mechanically. And the, the guy that, I forget his name, but he equates it to um, RF waves, but he's got a mechanical simulator showing what happens. Very interesting. And Antenna Toolkit's also a good book that's online. So that's it for this evening, and I thank you for your attention. And uh, hope to see you again. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Do appreciate it. Anybody have any questions real quick for Andy? Yeah. Questions? Good. Okay. Hey, Andy, I I I use my antenna analyzer. You know, I'm building those phased arrays now, and one of the things I use it for is one, like you said, to measure the velocity factor. Because somebody asked about the velocity factor being published, but that doesn't necessarily mean that is the velocity factor of that cable. Um, you should always, if you're making something as important as a phasing cable or a feed line for a, or a phased array, take a measurement. Uh, of that because sometimes it can be off up to two percent of the uh, velocity factor so always do that and the other thing i use is when i build my phasing cables or my feed cables if they have to be a certain degree so like a nine you know an 81 84 percent or 87 percent um feed line you've got to have that antenna analyzer to, to cut it just right to get it down to the minimum amount of uh, of resistance in in that cable so um, that's another good tool to have if you're going to build anything uh, with phasing cables or uh, dedicated feed lines for an array. You need to make sure you have an antenna analyzer or something that can give you that. A VNA will do it as well. 
Oh yeah, yeah. I, I also have. Well, I, I have a, um, a spectrum analyzer and a nano VNA um, that I use for for um, UHF and you know above. But um, they're not as convenient to use as is a this little um, antenna analyzer. So and it's got a lot of the same features in it. So it it is almost a VNA. You can perform almost all the measurements that you need to on an antenna with the VNA, but it's just not quite as convenient, I guess, is the way to say it. Yeah, those those Zoom um, rig experts are really nice. I have the AA600, and um, it's not nearly as nice as that Zoom. I wish I hadn't waited and, and got a Zoom. Um, I bought mine early on because it's that color screen and having the ability to do a little bit. It's got a little more functionality than, than the AA600. Oh yeah, and and I had a MFJ before this that, that I purchased at a ham fest, and I think many years ago, and it was like three hundred and twenty-five dollars back then. I, I bought this rig expert maybe two years ago, and I think I paid two hundred and fifty dollars for it. So the prices are are really for for what you get. You can't beat the yeah the one of the one of the club purchases coming up here very quickly. Darcy uh, received a generous donation from his employer, and we are purchasing a club antenna analyzer. I'm not sure which one we're getting yet. I'd, I'll leave that up to Darcy, but we are getting a, uh, a club antenna analyzer where we can check it out. People can, you know, sign for it and bring it back and and that kind of thing, so it doesn't get lost. Uh, but it'll be a club asset. Well, good. Maybe maybe my uh, presentation will help you um, look at some points to uh, to, to look for in, in an analyzer room. Sure. Anybody yeah, else have hey, any questions? Hey, hey, Andy. Good evening. Um, so it's interesting that Rig Expert used to be, I believe, manufactured in Ukraine before the war started. Yeah, it still and is. Yeah, Very still cheap. is. Yeah, we got an email. I got an email from him because I have a Rig Expert. I don't remember which model I have, but I love that antenna or antenna uh, the analyzer. Um, what? And you mentioned it, you briefly mentioned it here. The software package that you can download is extremely useful. You can take pictures, save save the charts, you can all from the comfort of your computer. You know, you can hook up your your antenna and just check the performance of it, you know, all that different stuff. I think the software is kind of undervalued that comes with it that allows you to use the analyzer with your computer just thought i'd mention that yeah it it i, I think to the resolution on this I, I think is only 100 points so when you do a full screen full um, scan it's not very granular um, with only 100 points but i think connected to the computer you can get more than a thousand points so you can get much more detail on on your scans with with the computer connection. I guess the negative side, you've got to buy two units if you want to cover HF, VHF, UHF, right? Unless you buy the, the rig expert, which is about twelve hundred dollars or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you need to to, to get one of the um, um, the, the higher um, uh, frequency models. But then, of course, when they go up in frequency, they go up in price too. Yeah. Well, the MFJ, I think, covers everything. Yeah, James, I'm looking at the uh, the 2000 is 1100. It's 1200 bucks, but the uh, yeah. the 600. I don't know if they make it anymore. They make the Zoom 650, which is about 800 dollars. That would be a pretty good uh, um, pretty good deal. By the way, uh, Brent just reminded me that our buddies here in town are expanding their amateur radio line by two-way radios now carries rig experts and if you mention you're part of the club you get five percent off now it's not a lot but it's five percent so they're carrying messy and poloni uh cable so i don't know if you guys know anything about messy and poloni coax but it's top-notch stuff man it's it's good stuff um and uh so you can get five percent off from them as well Okay, well, if there's no more questions, and thank you very much for your attention. And um, 
Uh, hope thank hope you yeah. learned something. Thank you, Andy. Do appreciate yeah. it. And we'll look forward to your presentation in October. All okay. right. Sounds Good great. Good night, everybody. Uh, thank uh, you, Andy. Thank you.